I think it's really interesting to talk about this uh, in the context of um, smartphones. And today, what I'm talking about will sort of touch on a condition created by the fact that we all have these recording devices in our pockets. Um, but I think I'd like to consider it sort of from the point of view of how our world is mediated by images um, and recordings in general, right? So beyond uh, just the smartphone, but to which the smartphone is like a huge contributor. So today's flaneur scrolls rather than strolls through the world. With our memories of events stored outside our bodies in the devices that see and hear for us, we possess this ability to inhabit the view of others, to switch perspectives and see through the eyes of many at once. Our sensory organs have extended beyond our own bodies and into others via these machines that sense and remember for us. But I'd like to ask that if machines can sense, why not other things? Buildings, architecture. A photograph is merely a series of chemical reactions or electronic signals, responses to a change in environment that causes that change to be registered. And so we might think of memory as the trace that an environmental change leaves on an object, be that object a mind, a sheet of film, a bone, or a building. So exposure to light causes chemicals on photosensitive film to react, imprinting an image of a moment on a material surface. Exposure to the habits, traumas, and labor that a human experiences leaves traces as fractures, textures, and deformations in bone, imprinting the history of a life lived in material volume. And in turn, exposure to fires, bombs, and bullets leave their traces as burns, cracks, and holes in architecture, imprinting the history of urban conflict in matter. And so the word aesthetics in its original Greek form meant to perceive. And so we might consider that every object and every image has its own aesthetic quality or its own way of perceiving the world around it. Um, so for a bit of background on what forensic architecture is, um, we're a research agency that operates on this premise, that objects and images that make up contemporary urban life are perceiving and sensing entities. So for us, the recognition that architecture and mass digital media perceive their environments is particularly significant when we rethink the power of civil society in urban conflict. So traditionally, forensics is a tool employed by state powers, as states are the ones that hold the authority and the technical infrastructure to control uh, access to evidence. And it's this evidence which they and other organisations are then held accountable to. So the fact that largely states hold themselves accountable is particularly problematic in the cases where those same states execute violence upon their own populations or craft narratives justifying the use of violence against others. However, if we consider the possibility that the streets, the facades and the public squares in which this violence is enacted, if we consider that these places remember the acts that occur on and within them, we might try to invert the forensic gaze of the state in a practice that we refer to as counter forensics. So this practice is exploratory and experimental and often requires us to develop new tools for image analysis, 3D modeling, data mining, and visual communication. And so we're therefore a multidisciplinary practice. We're made up of architectural researchers, filmmakers, programmers, journalists, lawyers, and archeologists. So our mandate is to work on behalf of non-state organizations to investigate contemporary conflicts and human rights violations through rigorous analysis of digital media and dynamic 3D modeling of events. So today I'm gonna to take you through a few of our investigations in order to illustrate some of the techniques that we've developed and that we're working on. Um, but I just wanna give a quick warning that the following slides have some images of violent events. So it's nothing directly graphic or gory, but they are videos uh, that sometimes imply violence um, and in some cases death. Um, so just please bear that in mind. Um, so I'm gonna briefly start with the case that's exhibited here as part of the exhibition um, and examines the bombing of a mosque in Algina, which is near Aleppo in Syria. Um, it was a project that was self-initiated by the office um, and it was conceptualized as a quick emergency response project when the team realized in early 2017 that the US had potentially bombed an operating civilian mosque. Um, so this investigation took place before I joined the FA team. Um, so the full story you can see in the film um, but I'm going to point out some of the methods that we use that will also become relevant for some of the other projects I'm going to show you through this project. 
So our work often starts with evidence that's in the public domain. And we found that social media networks and channels like Twitter tend to supply us with a wealth of real-time, often citizen-sourced recordings of urban warfare. So this case started with a single image released by the US Central Command, or CENTCOM. And it was released on their Twitter account showing a semi-destroyed building, apparently to show that their precision airstrike had killed dozens of Al-Qaeda militants who were meeting in a partially constructed meeting hall without targeting or damaging what they said was the mosque in the top left corner of the photo. So a Syrian civil organization, the White Helmets, claimed that 38 civilians, including five children, were killed in this strike. And we were trying to establish the use of the building that was destroyed. Um, so this introduces sort of one of our first techniques um, where we reconstruct 3D models to locate and view images and videos. Um, and this technique we refer to as the architectural image complex. So here we projection map visual media into a navigable virtual model, allowing for an investigator and a viewer to move between media without cutting in space or time. So in this sense, our models are operative and, and representational. And this means that we use them both for research. So um, as an investigation is ongoing, we work through these models to fill in and construct our understanding of the site through corroborating photographs and other media and also for communication. So to explain spatial scenarios in public fora, um, like art spaces or legal fora, like the courts. So in this case, we use this method of image projection to compare footage of the mosque from before its destruction to footage filmed by a local photographer that we contacted after the strike. And here the architecture, the scale and proportion of windows and roofs and doors allowed us to match interior and exterior footage and allowed us to detail the interior of our model showing us that there were elements such as the Athan speaker, shoe shelves, floor rugs, and the mihrab, which all verify that the building was in fact a functioning mosque. Uh, what was interesting is that these navigable models also become sites in which witness testimony can be illustrated. And so we've used these 3D models as live memory aids and interviews with witnesses who can use the model to describe the location of internal walls, furniture, and people. And so for this project, the architectural plan became a recurring communicative tool for our investigation team and people that we interviewed on site who recounted the mosque's internal layout via drawings of plans sent over smartphones. So we refer to this process of comparing remote imagery, such as satellite imagery and drone footage with local media and testimony as ground truthing. So in this case, we were lucky enough to have a local photographer who captured and sent us material on his phone which also allowed us to confirm the use of Hellfire missiles beyond the bombs that hit the building. And this indicated that fleeing people were also targeted. So the photographer on the ground captured the distinctive marks of a fragmentation pattern on the road leading to the mosque, which we were able to insert into our 3D model by matching the image with the position of our road and objects in the scene like electricity poles. So in all cases where we have access to visual media, we use this ground truthing method where we verify testimony, news reports, and our own interpretations by corroborating on-site media in a navigable 3D model. So perhaps no case illustrates this concept of relational media better than the Grenfell Tower fire of June 2017. Um, this is still an ongoing investigation for us, and it's got some live elements. So what I'm showing you today is partially old work. Um, so while we're currently formulating our response, this is sort of what's able to be public so far. Uh, this has been a unique case for us, not least because it occurred in London, so close to home for most of us. But it's also a case where we're not necessarily looking to point fingers or assign blame, but rather to assemble a public record of the event that gathers all available evidentiary evidence, uh, evidentiary resources in a single place. So Grenfell was another case that we initiated um, as a self-funded uh, and initiated project. Um, and waking to the news on June 14th, we decided that we could help in efforts to make sense of the thousands of documents and videos captured on the night of the fire. So taking place in London, one of the world's most networked and watched cities, we were presented in this case with an unprecedented amount of footage, one of the reasons that this has become such a large and long project. And so we're aiming to assemble all this footage together in what we're calling a media archive by using a 3D model of the site to hold all the recordings and we ultimately hope that this will be available as a web-based interactive platform through which the public can explore the sequence of events as described through a media evidence. As our investigation started alongside a government public inquiry into the fire, our work was limited to evidence in the public domain. 
so footage from news reports and rushes, YouTube, Twitter, and Periscope feeds, as well as media sent to us by the public after our open call for media. In this case, even before the inquiry started releasing police and firefighter videos, CCTV stills, and expert reports, this was hundreds of videos and thousands of files. And our first task was to synchronize all this material in time. And while metadata and video files often allows us to establish recording times and, if we're lucky, GPS locations, most online streaming sites like YouTube or even some file sharing sites strip a file of all this metadata. And because of how we were collecting these files from the public, it meant that a lot were not originals and therefore didn't have this metadata. And so it was several months of work for our team to piece together a media timeline of events using time-stamped continuous videos from Sky News as our guide. And so on this timeline that we constructed, we can see footage being divided by a facade and playing back in real time. So black on screen indicates that no footage was taken of that facade at that time. And this process required us to find visually synchronous moments in videos such as distinctive explosions on the facade or recognisable mo movements of people in order to establish the time on our publicly sourced videos. We did further synchronisation through audio using shouts, sirens and conversations heard in multiple media to align footage. Um, and I just want to use that as an opportunity to make a little short segue um, to say that it highlights the importance of keeping original files if you ever capture anything that might be uh, useful as evidence one day. So capturing events with your phone, storing the raw video rather than a version uploaded to WhatsApp, Facebook or Instagram or YouTube is really important for preserving this metadata. And we're sort of developing um, a set of guides for how to best record uh, evidence using the devices we all have, um, namely keeping the original files, um, filming continuously rather than starting and stopping, moving your camera around to capture all your surroundings in 360, um, if you can, giving commentary on what you're seeing uh, and taking note of what device you're filming on. So what followed and is still an ongoing process now um, is the camera tracking and projection mapping of the footage to our 3D model. So here, somewhat ironically, we're deploying workflows that were originally intended for CGI in Hollywood films to track the motion of cameras recording footage. An algorithm in 3D software searches for features recognisable in adjacent frames and records the distance in pixels that that feature moves. And so by doing this for hundreds of features across all the frames of a video, the motion can be averaged to extract the orientation, focal length and motion of the camera. And we then treat this camera as a projector in our 3D model and apply the moving footage from a moving virtual projector, which results in the footage appearing stabilised on the surface of our model. And for Grenfell, this was particularly useful as it allowed us to reference events seen in the footage against an accurate 3D model of the building, such as when lights switch on or off or when flats become affected by fire. And the hope is that this exercise, when combined with a record of emergency calls, text messages, fire crew radio transmissions and survivor testimonies, will provide a method for organising data that places temporally and spatially adjacent events adjacent in the actual archive. So the way we usually describe this phenomena is that a firefighter and survivor might pass each other in a staircase, and their subsequent testimonies might recount this same event, but their testimonies in document format might be separated by hundreds of pages and files, allowing connections between them to be easily missed. And so alternatively, by building a spatial and temporal 3D model, um, we put these events next to each other, allowing correlations to be exposed and read. Um, so this methodology, this methodology of camera tracking and projection mapping is something we use frequently, but it faces significant challenges when we take our investigations into other contexts, into the open sea, where everything is in motion. And the liquid and dynamic nature of the sea erases traces and imprints, giving every piece of visual evidence a fleeting lifespan. And so the next case describes in brief some of the techniques that we developed to get around this challenge. So this is our investigation of the seizure of the Juventa, which was an NGO search and rescue vessel that used to operate in the central Mediterranean Sea. To give a bit of context, this investigation is one of a series of incidents that we've looked at describing the closed sea condition imposed by Italy and the EU on central Mediterranean by containing migrants on Libyan shores. On the one hand, many NGOs involved in search and rescue have been criminalised and their vessels seized, and those still in operation have had their liberties to give assistance to drowning migrants severely curtailed. On the other hand, Italy has funded the Libyan Coast Guard and provided vessels to bring migrants at sea back to Libya. 
So on June 18th last year, the German NGO vessel Juventa was involved in a search and rescue operation off the coast of Libya. An undercover agent on board another NGO vessel, the Vos Hestia, photographed and reported the operation to Italian prosecutors. So his photographs were used to accuse the Juventa of cooperation with Libyan traffickers. And these allegations revolve around the key claim that the crew of the Juventa, after rescuing migrants from three wooden boats, towed the empty boats back toward Libya and handed them over to traffickers. To evidence this, the prosecution provided just one photo um, of one of Juventus' inflatable rescue boats towing one of the migrant vessels, a photo showing no horizon with no indication of direction, time, or context. Um, and as a result of these allegations, the Juventus was seized on the 2nd of August uh, later that year um, and is now still no longer in operation. So every vessel usually transmits AIS, or Automatic Identification System Tracking Data. Um, even though this is somewhat irregular. And so we began by sourcing these trajectories for the known NGO vessels, and this gave us a loose understanding of the operation relative to Libyan territorial waters. And in an email exchange with the Maritime Rescue Coordination Centre in Rome, we were given the coordinates of the migrant vessel, um, which was the first piece of evidence that Juventus' presence was totally legitimate. They were ordered to participate in this rescue. So our analyses try to cite evidence visually in both space and time here representing space on an animated map and time on a dynamic timeline. And also on site and located with AIS was the Vos Hestia, a larger NGO vessel used to ferry rescued migrants to destination ports. Once we located the vessels, we were able to move into 3D, making first attempts at reconstruction from the first photograph of the incident, when the Juventa captured two of the migrant vessels from a camera on its bow. So when we know the focal length and corresponding field of view of photograph from its metadata, like we were saying before, we can treat this camera as a projector, throwing the image back into 3D space to establish distances between objects. And soon after this photograph, a GoPro video from their rescue vessel uh, begins. So using identifiable shapes in the clouds, we treated them as the most stable elements in this scene. And we tried to algorithmically track the camera's motion to reproduce it digitally. So this allowed us to track the horizon in every direction relative to the GoPro. And luckily for us, during this video, the boat drifts in a full 360 degree circle as the crew gives safety advice to the migrants. So this allowed us to create a virtual sky dome and a horizon across which our footage, now projected from a dynamic camera, paints a panorama, a theater within which the operation takes place. And in a way, the rotation of the camera inadvertently becomes a visual radar sweeping across the scene and allowing us to plot the relative headings to vessels spotted as blurred pixels on the horizon. Then by counting the pixel height of these vessels and comparing that to the known height of the boats, we could use trigonometry to estimate their distance from the camera. So this technique gave us a base map for determining the relative positions of the migrant boats to the NGO ships, uh, which was necessary as those wooden vessels don't have tracking data. So in addressing this issue of towing the migrant vessel back to Libyan waters, um, we obtained a short section of footage from which the still used in the accusation was taken. And we wanted to analyze the direction of wave movement and compare them with wind charts for the time and day of the event to work out what direction the boat was being towed. So as the footage is taken on a handheld camera, we first had to track and stabilize the shot to remove motion from the camera from affecting our perceived wave motion. And once we'd stabilized the footage, we could track points of contrast in the footage and observe a general right to left motion in the waves, indicating that Juventus' crew were towing the migrant boat against the direction of the wind. So simulating the water's surface um, illustrates this movement. And when we compare this directionality with wind charts from the 18th of June, we see that this evidence used to imply that Juventus towed, boat back, towed boats back to Libyan territorial waters in fact, most likely shows that the boat is being towed north, away from the coastline. And as is often the case with our investigations, we later received additional material partway through our research. And in the new files that we received was included a time lapse shot by one of the inflatable boats of the Vos Hestia. So luckily, each of these photos in the time lapse included GPS metadata, which gave us precise locations and times for each image. And in several of these images, the same scene from the accusation can be seen from a different angle. 
And these images clearly show that Lily, which was Juventa's inflatable, was towing the empty wooden boat uh, back towards Juventa, not back towards Libya. In addition, when we compare two photographs in which the lily can be seen in both, we can infer that during the time of the towing, the lily moved approximately 800 metres northwest, again demonstrating that the boat was not being towed south. So despite this counter-investigation, the Juventus currently still impounded in the port of Trapani, while everyday migrant lives remain imperiled and are denied access uh, assistance from those both, both best trained and equipped to rescue them. So what this research has revealed are a set of digital tools that we hope to use for further image analysis at sea, where loss of life is hidden both optically and politically. And more than ever, we require an increasing engagement with digital imaging for recording, verification and analysis, just to make tangible the invisible effects of policy made in faraway chambers. Um, and this brings me to the final example that I'll show you today, which is a case that we've called the long duration of the split second referring to how split-second decisions have embedded within them long histories of cultural conditioning from which prevalent social and political narratives can be read. So this case is quite complicated, so I'm just going to show you one part of it that directly relates to the methods described in the previous work. So the event took place in the Negev Desert in Israel, where the Bedouin village of Um al Hiran was raided by Israeli police the morning before its residents were to be forcibly evicted as part of a general strategy of Israel to relocate Bedouin settlements. And on the morning of the raid, a number of activists and journalists gathered at the site to film and support the villagers' claim to their land. And this raid, which took place before dawn, was described by Karen Manor, who was a journalist on the site, as a war zone. This chaos was captured in a series of short videos taken by her. And while she wasn't aware at the time, the dark videos captured critical information for our analysis of the event that followed. In her footage and others, a moment of confusion quickly escalates into an event that saw shots fired and a vehicle crash, leaving policeman Erez Levy and villager Yaqub Musa al Kian dead and many others injured. So according to the initial, uh, the initial police narrative, the villager al Kian drove his car into the policeman, running him over in an act of terror. And to substantiate this claim, they stated that al Kian was driving with his headlights off and at high speed. To investigate this claim, we cross-referenced Karen's footage against a low-quality leaked video of police thermal footage shot from a helicopter on site. And in this footage, we see al Kian's car moving slowly and groups of policemen converging towards his position. He accelerates down the road, appearing to hit a group of policemen before seeming to lose control and is finally stopped by another vehicle. However, before he accelerates, we see a black cloud of hot air that appears for several frames in front of a policeman facing the car that indicates the discharge of a weapon. This same phenomena can be seen twice more, and these shots synchronise perfectly with shots heard in the audio channel of Karen Manor, who was coincidentally filming at the same time. The acceleration of the car begins after these shots, indicating that police opened fire before the car sped up. Additionally, with the geography of the vent clarified by the thermal footage, we realised that Karen's footage and the footage of a nearby Al Jazeera reporter both captured Al Kian's car at the moment of these shots. And crucially, in both pieces of footage, we can see that the headlights are on. In the journalist's footage, we see four figures cross the silhouette of the car. And to verify that this is indeed Al Kian's car, we mapped the movement of policemen according to a stabilised projection of the thermal footage. So here we see uh, in the Al Jazeera video four silhouettes passing in front of Al Kian's car. And we just wanted to make sure that we'd actually spotted the right car if we were going to claim that the headlights were on. So we compared this with the known positions of policemen at this time according to the thermal video to see if these perspectives would result in the same four silhouettes crossing the car. So we see these four figures cross the car in the same way, and this thus corroborates the thermal footage and the Al Jazeera recording, and shows that the car with the headlights on is indeed Al Kian's. So with the headlights on, this casts doubt on the police narrative that this was a premeditated terror attack. An additional piece of evidence makes it extremely unlikely that Al Kian's acceleration was indicative of a terror attack. 
In the thermal footage, the ground appears to be flat. However, when we plot the car's acceleration on a 3D model that we constructed of the site, it becomes apparent that the vehicle accelerates as the incline of the terrain increases. So here, the projection of the video into 3D space highlights how the slope was likely what caused the acceleration of the vehicle. Furthermore, a leaked autopsy report revealed that he'd been shot in the knee, which raises the possibility that one of the three shots before he accelerated disabled him and caused him to lose control of the car. And that it was potentially this, in combination with the landscape, that resulted in the death of policeman Erez Levy. So far, in the light of these findings, the police on site have not been properly investigated, and so our work on this case is ongoing. So as a civil practice, we come from a position of optical inferiority. Full data sets and information are often withheld, and this puts our work at the periphery. The evidence that is in the public is by nature at the edge. And so in order to draw out meaningful information, our work must often operate at the edge of evidence and media, and we have to look for connections between disparate sources. Looking beyond the frames of photographs and videos, or in between the words of testimonies, to see how we might infer data from them, and data from the relationships between them. So our practice revolves around looking for these truth misalignments and factual corroborations between disparate sources of media. And in always citing evidence in navigable spatial and temporal models, we try never to experience evidence in the singular, but rather inhabit an, inhabit an environment that displays this evidence simultaneously. We believe that in a world where versions of truth, narrative and media are so overabundant and entangled, the development of tools to unravel these relationships has never been more important. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Nathan Sue. Um, any questions from there directly? I think. Um, the complexity of the material you were presenting us is, um, at least for my uh, little brain, a little overwhelming because um, there's something like um, probably thousands of hours of, of, of work and labor in it and it is a, it is a totally different um, um, aspect of um, how to use um, database than we, we have been speaking before. Um, I think it's highly interesting and um, it really opens up for me and personally a, a totally new field even if I saw naturally the installation over there. So um, the question, my first question is um, on which basis are you picking um, your research objects or subjects? Um, so we usually take on cases through a number of avenues. Um, often we're approached um, by a NGO or a Groups like Amnesty International have approached us to us to collaborate on investigations. So sometimes we enter when research um, on a case is already well underway from um, another agency and they need um, specific analysis of optical objects. In those, in those cases, we're given media and asked, you know, what can we, what are we able to say with these um, pieces of media? Um, another way is sometimes we're approached much, much earlier on in an investigation. Um, and we're asked, it's usually a case where uh, the truth around, or rather the facts around uh, what happened in an event are highly ambiguous. And um, in those cases, we often then engage with the process of data mining where we sort of scour the, um, both sort of locally by asking people who are present on site um, and by searching the internet for recordings, uh, we try to build an understanding of what happened um, that way. And then, I guess from another point of view, we also sometimes, um, as was with uh, two of these cases, do projects on a self-initiated basis. So where we think that um, our skill set has something to offer and we, um, where our office really believes that um, some questions need to be at least raised, um, if not addressed, um, we take those projects on, on our own. Um, and then within each project, the choice of what media to use and how to use it um, is very much based on our ability to link it to other media. So our first task is always to try to synchronize images, synchronize videos. Um, and what we've found quite consistently is that it's in the relationships between different media objects in understanding that 
when we see the same event from two perspectives, we get far more information than when we see it from one. Um, that's what helps us choose what media to work with, because not all of the media um, always can be synchronised. So we prioritise stuff that um, sits within a sort of collaborative media archive. Is there always, uh, are there always enough data? Um, or did you have to drop down a project because you didn't find enough um, data? Yeah, there's, um, there's definitely not always enough data. And so that's one of the criteria uh, in how we decide whether it's uh, not only good for us, but good for the people that we're working for, for us to be involved. Um, for us to be involved, there needs to be um, obviously the sort of human rights and political angle, but also um, the media angle that means that there is some sort of evidence that we can address. In the past, we have looked at cases where the evidence is purely testimonial, um, without images. Um, and in those cases, it's been cases that have evolved more around developing tools for assisting and reconstructing space through memory and um, testimony. Um, but always, like before we start an investigation, there's sort of a pre-investigation phase that works out how capable we are um, to solve those problems. I can hear you. <laughs> um, do, you ever, do you ever feel it's necessary to make site visits, I guess the way traditional forensic investigators used to do things, uh, or, or is it about what's remotely available? Uh, it's both. So in the case that I just showed you um, in the Negev Desert, Part of the investigation was a site visit where we reconstructed the event on site. So we got the same model of vehicle. Um, members of the villagers who were there on the day helped us um, roll the same vehicle down the same slope to verify um, speed. So we do physical reenactments on site as part of it. Um, a lot of it comes down to access, um, whether we have access to the sites that we're investigating and whether it's, you know, it's safe to send a team there, whether, um, whether the site that we're investigating still exists uh, is also a problem that we face. Um, and so if it's possible for us to, to go on site, we often will try. Um, but in a lot of our cases, um, for practical and political reasons, that's sometimes not possible. Um, and part of that is also the, uh, that condition that I was talking about of our sort of optical inferiority, where we're coming from a position where we have restricted access to locations, we have restricted access to evidence. And so we're really trying to develop tools that allow us to uh, augment publicly available evidence. So it's, a, it's both, and ideally, where we can, we try to go on site, but it doesn't always happen. And currently, you're, uh, you're being approached by organisations which, for want of a better phrase, uh, see themselves as being on the right side of history. <laughs> um, at, at the same time, good forensic protocols must make no judgments. Absolutely. Um, is there a conflict of interest there? Um, I mean, the way we try to treat evidence is that we're, uh, I guess we can come from two angles. One is that uh, in our actual analysis, uh, we try to never show anything that the media itself doesn't show. So like we try to only to, to highlight things within uh, and when I say media, I, I guess I refer not to media narratives um, of media organisations, but to um, the pieces of evidence, visual and sonic, that we have. Um, from the other point of view, though, we do believe that there is a power differential in how the narratives around state violence are constructed. Um, and so we are also, while we try to always be objective as we can, we do also see a role for the organisation to provide these counter-narratives um, that run in parallel to um, narratives uh, driven by sort of uh, state agendas as well. So, and I think that that sort of gaze of sort of forensics with an agenda is not something that is um, unique to counter forensics in the sense that forensics um, done as traditionally by the state is also subject to the same um, sort of 
agendas that may back that investigation. Hi, I have a sort of a technical question. Um, you, you spoke of the synchronizing process in the beginning, and I was wondering um, how much is uh, the computer doing of this work, and how much do you have to correct it, and is it getting the ratio? Is it getting better and better? Uh, currently, our synchronization is almost 100% manual. Um, so it's from a researcher sitting in front of all the footage and like looking for and listening for things that sound the same that look the same. Uh, as we grow as an agency and as our cases become more complicated and as more people film these events um, as time goes on, this becomes a more and more taxing operation, right? When it's fine to synchronize 10 pieces of footage, when we're dealing with 1,000 pieces of footage to synchronize is a colossal task. Um, so we're also investigating ways to sort of embed this within machine learning, um, but this is very new um, uh, territory for us. Um, and so obviously before we actually use that to do anything, we need to have verified that it works within our own workflow. Um, it's a hope for the future that we're able to integrate sort of um, human research and machine research. Uh, but at the moment, most of our synchronization is done manually. Okay, thank you. Um, one short question in between. Uh, Does it work? Yeah. And one short question in between. Um, how do you finance your projects, your, um, the projects that are brought to you by organizations? Um, are these organizations also paying your work like a, like a regular um, good after, whatever that is um, meaning? Uh, I don't know the, the, uh, the English word. Can you want um, the English Bedeutung des Wortes good after? Consultant? Maybe. Yeah. So. Um, we have a few different sources of funding. Um, we're, sourced, uh, we're funded by a few European um, arts grants and human rights grants. Um, and we're also, so part of our funding comes from sort of arts and education um, funding. Uh, we are also often um, commissioned by uh, the organizations that approach us. Um, but we're a non-profit organization, so the commissions are just to cover um, the labor and the tools and technologies to perform the investigations. Um, those uh, organizations that work with us are sometimes uh, galleries that are commissioning an art piece. They're sometimes uh, media organizations um, uh, that are looking to do a collaboration, um, so news channels, um, that sort of thing, um, and sometimes uh, human rights organizations. Okay, thank you. This would have been my question, but now I can ask something else. Um, so, for instance, the, the project you did for the Documenta, um, I don't want to be polite, but I, I'm wondering how, how much did it cost the organization? I was wondering. Because it's a kind of you know, economic uh, counter. How much is, does it cost to over, um, show that one status lying or <laughs> to construct the counter narrative? That's, I was wondering. Yeah, um, I don't have enough information on the precise budgeting for every project to be able to give you a, a figure for that. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't give you a precise number. Because you know, your, your group is very big and you're working a long time on the project, so I was wondering, it must be huge, so that was my... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it depends also, like, we're obvi we obviously want to do this work and we think that this work is important, like, we're, that, uh, any cost is, is to cover the necessary um, production. Um, and we, you know, we're a growing team, but we are still quite small. We're, I mean, medium sized now, sort of 19 people. Um, and we usually have sort of two to three researchers working on a case. Um, and as far as cost goes, it really, it does vary depending on what the, the techniques used are. Some of our cases go for years, some of our cases go for days, yeah. um, because sometimes an investigation can be like a, two-day response where we just do a, a 3D model, match one photograph, and that's our investigation. In other cases, we might be getting updated information over two to three years as information is slowly released from um, courts and that sort of thing, um, and then those projects take a lot longer. So there's a huge um, variance in, in cost of labor and time. And uh, the second, it's more a remark, but um, somehow um, when I look at the videos, it reminds me of for, for the visual things I see. It reminds me of kind of Hollywood films where they 
prepare an attack or somewhere, and uh, this is a bit frightening to see it. Uh, you know, it's hunting in a way <laughs> uh, to see the the um, material uh, implanted into it. So the re reality getting into it. So it's really um, it strikes and it's really tough to see your work. So thank you very much for your <laughs> works. Thanks. Um, this is also about my work. You haven't seen my presentation yesterday, but yeah, sorry. Aren't, uh, no problem. But aren't we running into the problem that we're becoming complicit? And this is um, this uh, troubles me with my own work because if we access certain topics in certain ways, um, we make them cool, we make them accessible, we make them fancy. And if I look at the work, maybe, okay, let's, let's not talk about your work, let's not talk about my work, let's, let me bitch about Trevor Paikland. Um, he made um, surveillance, the whole surveillance apparatus, extremely fashionable through his work. It's brilliant to look at, but this problem is that especially surveillance is a topic that feeds of our attention, that needs our attention to really function. And if you point the finger in such a fancy way, I mean, these, the research is good, but what the heck has it to do in an art environment, I think? Because it becomes extremely wonderful and nice to look at and fancy. But to me, and my own work is the same, I have the same issue with some of my works as well. It's extremely misplaced because we draw the wrong kind of attention to terrible topics. Isn't that an issue? No. <laughs> um, so, can I make an initial response to that? And then, I think this is like a territory that we're very aware of. Like this, that this condition that. Uh, we're always afraid that we're sensationalizing violence in a way. And I think that, that it's something that we have to tread very carefully with and, and be aware that we're, uh, it's possible that we're, we're doing it. And this is why it is also like, it's been problematic for us to work um, within sort of the realm of calling ourselves artists. Um, but at the same time, I think it is our hope and I mean, it's interesting that it comes across as fancy, um, but our hope is that our work uses the tools that are necessary for the, the communication of uh, our analyses in a way that makes sense, right? And there is a reason that we do it in film and not in a report, for example. Like, we could reformat all these cases as a 20-page report or as a 200-page report, and often we do for legal cases. So when we're, we're working within a legal forum, we often use different media formats. But it precisely creates the, the, the condition which we're trying to resist, which is that the media are observed asynchronously. And so at the moment, maybe because it's new or maybe because it's, it's seen as sort of uh, an innovative visual practice, we're uh, creating techniques that come across as uh, like being overly aestheticized. Um, and it's something that we're trying to struggle with, is how do we develop a visual language that is able to communicate um, without being sort of an overly aesthetic piece, but that communicates everything we want to say clearly in a way that's consumable to an audience. And I do think it's important that this work makes it out of courtrooms and um, into public mind. Yeah, I felt that the piece that you had in the show was not theatrical at all. I thought it was very fact-based and I thought, um, you took the emotion out of it. Yeah, so, we try. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I mean. so I didn't get the same feeling that you got about it. So I think that, that yours is actually, you're creating art and you're trying to show your thinking and what your you know, conclusions are, where they're looking for facts strictly. But it's not facts, it's one behind the facts. It is, I think there is a big difference between the two. Between the two artworks, yes. there's yes. one connection link, but there's a big difference. Even if you shake your head, I nod. <laughs> and um, I think that is really necessary because um, um, you have, um, you, you both have something which has a, a, a basic um, layer, which means, or, or basic, uh, a common ground, which means you start acting after something has happened. 
and you're trying to reconstruct something which has happened on a time-based level. This is something which is totally different from at least what you were presenting there. You were showing, you are, you are presenting and showing things. So, but, my, but I also have a question, and this question is, um, what kind of results can you gain um, with your research when you put it into a, into a law case or when you bring it to public? As we saw from that Juventus ship, it is still there. And um, um, I, I mean, obviously, Italian government seems to be pretty, pretty scary right now. But um, despite that, um, are there any positive results of the work you have um, you did so far as an institution? Um. So, I mean, a few of the cases um, have resulted in reopening of court cases um, and in the uh, sort of, for example, a white phosphorus case um, resulted in uh, the US saying that they were no longer going to use those weapons. Um, it, is, it is a difficult thing for us, though, as we have limited legitimacy in both the art world and in the legal world in the, in the sense that these two narratives often like run against each other sometimes. And so the, our attitude is really, though, that I think that shouldn't stop us from doing the work, right? That, that if there is information there that uh, is being misrepresented um, and we think that we're able to um, offer another narrative into the world, like, that for us already that is um, valuable, right? And that's a reason to do it. Um, of course, our hope is that, you know, we were, we were hoping that uh, the video we produced for Juventa would result in at least a reconsideration of them releasing the vessel. Um, and in many cases, sadly, that doesn't come to pass, but I think it's still work that's important to do.